Good evening. Thank you for tuning in to Highlands Park Missionary Baptist Church online Wednesday night Bible study, where our pastor is Byron L. Cox. We thank you for joining us through the way of social media. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this hour. We thank you for the opportunity to learn a little bit more of you. Now, Father God, just decrease me as you increase in me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, and thank God. Today's Bible study, well, tonight's Bible study lesson will be return to your first love. Return to your first love. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. We all had items that we used to cherish or we used to do that is now in the back of our closets or on the floor of our closet or in our garage in a box somewhere. It could have been a pair of our running shoes where we used to run all the time or some weights where we lift weights. It could be a, a whole box of half-finished half craft products that we used to do. And it could be an instrument that we used to play. Like, like me, I have two pianos, one keyboard and a piano uh, that just sit there for years and years and nobody really tickled those ivories. But losing our enthusiasm for a hobby, it's not bad. It's not bad. But it's a whole different ball game when it comes to relationships like marriages or friendship. You know, the relationships start out strong and it is bonded with love. And you couldn't get enough of that person. Uh, in the marriages, you need to talk, you talk to that person, you bat your eyes and every time uh, someone say that person's name, you get giggly and and you just get that warm feeling inside or a friendship, a friendship where you used to do everything together. You call each other up two and three times a day. And where you seen one, you seen the other. But somewhere down the line, we get busy doing things that we wanted to do. And we crowd out that love one. We wake up one day and your spouse might say, where is that love that you used to give me? How come you don't love me like you used to do? But what if we're not talking about a marriage or a friendship? What if we're talking about Jesus Christ? What if we're talking about how Jesus said to you, why don't you love me the way you used to do? Tonight we're going to go take a glimpse, look at a church in Revelation chapter 2, the church of Ephesus, the Ephesian church. They had ultimately left their love for Jesus Christ. And I said, left that love for Jesus Christ. I didn't say lost. And we'll go in that in a minute. But they left their love for Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 2. We're going to read the first four verses. First one. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things say he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven gold lampstands. Verse 2 and 3. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say that they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have per persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. For 
and have not become weary. I'm sorry. In verse 4, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Let's go to that first verse. That first verse. This is, uh, this is the Allen of Patmos, and this is John. John. God gave John a vision on the Allen of Patmos. He was a prisoner you know, on the Allen of Patmos. And Jesus, in chapter 2, Jesus told John to write seven letters to seven different churches. And the church we're going to talk about is the church of Ephesus, the Ephesian church. When we look at Ephesus, Ephesus was a city who was famous for their religion uh, and their economic economic of their region. Ephesus had the temple of Diana. She was the fertility god. And the temple of Artemis, which was a major treasury and the bank of the ancient world where merchants, kings, and even cities made deposits. Ephesus was also the stronghold of Satan. Here were the evil things, both superstitious and satanic, were practiced. Now, Ephesus was also where Paul ministered for three years. And it's also is where Aquila, Priscilla, with Apollos served in Ephesus. And Paul also told Timothy to go to Ephesus and work in Ephesus as an evangelist. So this place, Ephesus, was surely a great place of great preaching, a great preaching. So when we look at Jesus, the character of Ephesus, Jesus said to the angel of the church, of Ephesus. Now, when we talk about the angel of the church, we talk about the pastor of the church or the head of the church in Ephesus. And Jesus told John to write this letter. But it was not only to the angel of the church. It was for the whole church. And just as today, that letter still holds true for our church today. And we'll see how that that holds true to our church today. Jesus says, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his hand, who walks in the midst of the seven gold lampstands. Now, the lampstand represented the churches. And the light on the lampstand or the candle on the lampstand represents the light that the church had to bring people in, or it also represents the presence of God in the churches. So when it said he holds, Jesus Christ holds these church in his hand. He holds them securely in his hand. These churches do not belong to the pastors. These churches do not belong to the deacons. These churches do not belong to the church member. These churches belong to Christ. He holds them securely in his hand. In verses 2 and 3, what Jesus know about the Christians of Ephesus. He said, I know your works. I know your labors. Let's see the positive things that the church of Ephesus, Ephesus did. It said, the church of Ephesus, Jesus pointed out that they worked hard. They had patience and endurance and did not tolerate evil. Jesus said, I know your works. So Jesus looked at his church and he knew the conditions of the church. 
see, so it wasn't no mystery to him how the church was. You cannot hide from Jesus Christ because he knows your works. And Jesus said your works, positive. He put something positive. He knows your works, your labor, your pace and Joseph. Jesus knew that this church, this church, what they did right. They worked hard for the Lord. They had godly endurance. They had patience. They were steadfast in the Lord. In a sense, the Ephesians church was rock solid. He also said you cannot bear those who are evil. So the Ephesians, the Ephesian church, uh, they did not like evil. So Paul warned the Ephesian church in Acts 20, verse 29 through 31, and it says, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourself, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So from this command, commendation of Jesus, we know that the, the Ephesian church took Paul's warning seriously. Because the Ephesian church, it says, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not. So what uh, the church did, they rooted out who was the false prophet. So in the church today, like the Ephesian church, we must also root, root out who are false prophets. Uh, when we look, at first John, first John chapter four, verses one and three, it says, Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit to see if it is from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. God. So the Ephesian church, they definitely tested the spirit to see if it was of God. They were like the Berean church. When Paul preached to the Berea church, the Berea church did not take Paul for his word. They searched the scriptures to make sure Paul was telling the truth. So when we look at the church of Ephesus, it shows that they were the backbone of truth. In today's churches, we too need to separate the false prophets from the true prophets. And how we do that? We test the spirit to see if it is of God. And then it goes on to say that you have persevere and have patience and have labor in my name's sake and have not become weary. So the church of Ephesus, they was doing, they were laboring in the Lord and did not grow weary. So we too ought to imitate the church of Ephesus. But there was something that Jesus was against the church in the fourth verse, it tells us, it said, nevertheless, I had this against you that you had left your first love. Nevertheless. Nevertheless mean that all that the good that the Ephesian church did did not, did not cancel out the bad that Jesus described. Jesus said, you have left your first love. Notice the Bible did not say lost your first love. You have left your first 
love. So the, despite everything that the Ephesian church was doing, there was something wrong that Jesus pointed out. They left their first love and not lost their first love. And so the, the difference between leaving and losing, let me tell you, something that you lose, you can't find it. You don't know where to find it. But when you leave something, you deliberately abandon that post, abandon that person, or abandon your love, and you know where to find it. So, we can look at the Ephesus church had left their first love. Everything looked great on the outside. If we went to the church of Ephesians, we will see that they was working in the Lord. And I like to call it church work. They were working in the Lord. They were laboring in the Lord. They were testing the spirit but to see if it is of God. They were working in the Lord and did not get weary. But something was wrong. See, that's on the outside. God looks at the inside. The problem was serious. The problem was that they did not have that first love. Without love, everything you do is vain. So no wonder Jesus said, nevertheless, I have this against you. A church that has no love have no reason of being a church. So when the church has no love, it grows cold. You left your first love. So what love did they leave? Did, as Christian, we are told to love God and love one another. Uh, in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 and 39, said Jesus said unto them, him, thou shalt love thy Lord God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So they probably lost, they probably left, I'm sorry. They probably left both God and loving one another. Because the two loves goes together. So the Ephesian church was, work, was a working church, but they was working without love. Sometimes when we take our focus of working for Jesus with the eclipse of a love relationship with him, sometimes we put what we do for Jesus before what we have in him. I'm going to say that again. Sometimes we do, sometimes what we put, what we do, when we put what we do for Jesus before, before Jesus, what we have in Jesus, we lose our focus. We, we take our eyes off the prize. So what did Paul say about love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13? one through three. He said, if I speak in human and angelic tongues, but do not have love, I am a resounding gong or a clashing cymbal. And if I have the gift of prophecy and comprehend all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have the faith as soul to move mountains, but do not have love. I am nothing. If I give away everything I own and I hand my body over so that I may boast, but not have love, I gain nothing. So even Paul said, all these things, prophecy, if you give to the poor, if you give your soul over 
But if you don't have love, you are nothing and you gain nothing. When love dies, the orthodox doctrine is like a corpse. It's powerless. The adhesion to the truth sour in bigotry when the sweetness, come on somebody, when the sweetness and the light of the love of Jesus departs. First love. When we look at the first love, things aren't what they used to be. It isn't that we expect the excitement that we had when we had the first love, when we came to Jesus, when we, had, when we first became Christian. It is that our excitement, our love should transist into a death that makes the first love even stronger. So what am I saying? That our first love should grow even stronger for the Lord as we mature. It should, it should not decrease, but it should increase. So let's look at a couple in a marriage. If a couple was married for a long time and doesn't have that same thrill or excitement they had on their first date, that is to be expected. And it's fine if that excitement has matured into the depth of the love that makes that love even better. We're talking about the even better than that first love. So there's nothing wrong with initial excitement or wanting it to remain or be restored. But when we were first in love with Christ, what were our actions? What did we do? We need to look back on that to see what we have done. We're talking about our first love. Let's go into verses 5 and 6 of Revelation chapter 2. And it's what Jesus wants the church of Ephesus to do. Now, he pointed out the good that the Ephesian church was doing. And he pointed out the problem that they had, that they left their first love or they abandoned their first love. Now, how do we get that first love back? So Jesus is going to clearly tell them how to get that first love back. It says in verse 5 and 6, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So, when we look at the Ephesians church, they have left their first love, but Jesus offered a clear example of returning back to their first love. He said, remember, remember, what is it that Jesus wants the Ephesians church to remember? What is it that Jesus wants us as a church to remember when we lose our first love? He said, remember, the first step of restoration is to remember. Remember what? They needed to remember from where they had fallen. This means remembering where they used to be in their first love for the Lord and for one another. When we look at the prodigal son, 
in Luke chapter 15, he was in the pig pen. And the first step of rest restoration was remembering where he came from. In Luke 15, verses 17 through 19, uh, the prodigal son said, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants had bread enough and to spare, and I perished with hunger. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your higher servants. This is always the first step of restoration. Remember where you have fallen from. Remember the things that made your first love for Christ. In the prodigal son's son state, he remembered where his father, how his father had enough food that he didn't need to be in that pig pen eating the corn cob. He remember restoration. He remember where he had fallen. Then Jesus told him to repent. He said, remember, therefore, where you have fallen, repent. Now, this is not a command to feel sorry for yourself or feel uh, or be, be for, ask for forgiveness. This repent is where you change direction and go in the Lord's way. I would say a different way, but go the way the Lord have you to go. So, we saying this is urgent. You need to repent before it's too late. And as we look at our Christian walk today, repentance is a daily action. Christian life is a daily repentance because we can't walk through the day without sinning. So we need to repent to the Lord. We need to get on our knees and pray and say, Lord, forgive me of the sin knowingly and unknowingly. So we need, we need to repent. And then it goes on to say to Repent and do the first works. Repent and do the first work. So this means to go back to the basics. Go back to where you had the first love. Go back to the things that you used to do. So what are the first works? What are the first works that Jesus is talking about? I'm glad you asked. Remember how you used to spend time in your Bible? You used to spend time with God. In other words, you know, a lot of marriages today, they've been married for 20, 30 years. They have what they call date night. They still have date night. So remember how you had a date with God in your Bible. That's part of your first works. Remember how you used to spend time in your Bible, reading and studying your Bible. Remember how you used to pray. You used to pray before your foot hit the floor. You used to pray when you driving to work. You used to pay, pray during work or school. You used to pray when you came home from work or in traffic. You used to pray when you go to bed, before you go to bed, be, bed at night. Remember the joy you had getting together with other Christians and studying the Bible. We're talking about first works here. Remember how you used to share your faith or tell your stories to people that needed to hear your story. Remember your first works. We might say that Satan is doing a master job because he can uh, give you the sense of general dissatisfaction doing your first work. And as you look at the Ephesus church, that's what happened. Their attention span 
was not long enough. So they got bored. Mm -hmm. They got bored with studying the word. They got bored with praying. They, and, and Satan, the one that gave them this feeling. But if you stay in your word, and if you scriptured up, and if you prayed up and put on the whole armor of God, you can break the chains of Satan's stronghold. Now, Jesus goes to say that, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from his place. Now, the lampstand had the candle on it, and the candle represents the light, the light that calling people to come to you, the light that it was the presence of God. So Jesus said, you know, unless you repent, I will remove that light in my presence, God's presence in your church. You will no longer be a true church for the Lord. Oh, yeah, you can operate as an organization, but you will not be the true church. It will be like the church of Ichabod. And when I said the church of Ichabod, in 1 Samuel 4 and 21, Phineas' wife uh, was, had a baby, and he, she named her son Ichabod because the ark was stolen and her husband and her father-in-law died. And that meant the glory of the Lord had departed. Ichabod. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Now, the Nicolaitans, the Nicolaitans, they were followers of Nikolai. First of all, they were uh, ordained, they were the first seven ordained to be deacons from the apostles. And they led lives of unstrained re indulgence. They taught a combination of idolatry and immortality. So Jesus said, and this is a strong word, he said, I hate the deeds. He never did say, I hate the people. He never did tell the church of Ephesians uh, saying that you hate the Nicol Nicolaitans. He said you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. You don't hate the sinners, but you hate the sin. And so that's what Jesus said. He hated the sin. Now in verse 7, Verse 7, it says, he who has an ear, let him hear. The Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So, the whole entire process that we need to return back to Jesus here is the key. Listen. Listen. The whole process of repentance, renewal cannot begin to happen if you don't listen. It says anyone that has an ear should listen to what the Spirit has to say. And so Jesus said that there's going to be a promise of a reward if you listen to what the Spirit has to say. say. And that promise to him who overcomes. And what are we overcoming? What are we overcoming? We overcoming the sin and the spiritual warfare that we in encounter. Jesus say, seemed to speak of overcoming their coldness of their heart and the lack of the love that they had for God and for the other people. So the promise 
of these overcomers to return to Eden, to return to Eden, Eden and restoration and to have eternal life. That was the promise and in the midst of the paradise of God. And that, that means to be in the place where God is. So when we look at returning to our first love, we got to first remember what I want you to do this week. I want you to write down the things that you used to do when you first came to Christ. And are you doing that now? Or have you lost, um, excuse me, have you left your first love? Have you abandoned your first love of Christ? Then I need you to repent. I need you to return away from what you're doing, that sin that you're doing, and go in the direction that God is leading you to. Turn away from your sin today. And then return to your first love. Return to the place where you found Jesus. Return to your place where you abandoned Jesus. Return to your place. Because when you left your love, you know exactly where you left your love. You didn't lose your love. You left it. So the wonderful thing about God's grace, God's amazing grace, it doesn't matter what you have done or where you have been because God's grace is sufficient. God's grace is greater than any sin. So throw yourself in the loving arms of Jesus Christ and return back to that first love. Return to that first love. Is God saying, how come you don't love me like you used to? Or is God saying, thank you for coming back to me? May God bless you. May God keep you. Return back to your first love. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for giving us the scripture telling us to remember, to repent, and to return back to our first works that we did when we first loved you. Father God, just keep inside of us the love of Christ that we had, not only for God, to love God with our heart, mind, and our soul, but to love one another as we love ourselves. We thank you for these words that you have brought to us tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, and thank God. Be blessed and have a blessed week. Amen.